with a rousing <laughs> reply, <laughs> the, church, the church said, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to wake anyone up. <laughs> You're supposed to save your nap for the sermon. <laughs> right? All right. Uh, please stand if you would like to stand. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 7, verse 17. <laughs> You're happy with the sound of the thunder rain. You're happy in the calm of the wind in the waves. You're happy in the glow of a burning flame, burning flame. Praise the wind to my love. song. <laughs> You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Well, this morning, I'm going to take you all to seminary. We're going to have an advanced hermeneutics lesson this morning. How many of you guys know that word, hermeneutics? Yeah, that's a scary word. Even you got to go to seminary just to know what the word means, right? Hermeneutics is the science of studying the scripture, how the, the grammar works and how uh, the plays on words work and how you have metaphor and simile and parable and how to study in its cultural context, all that kind of stuff. I discovered something in the book of Revelation that was way cool, and it led me on a... a not a rabbit trail, but I got to work my way up to the lesson, okay? So we're going to do advanced hermeneutics this morning, but I got to get there. So I'm going to start with something that we've talked about in the past. You know, it's commonly taught this doctrine in churches 
that God rejected the Jewish people because the Jewish people rejected Jesus. Well, we reject that doctrine. It's wrong on every which level. And this stuff is mentioned throughout Scripture over and over and over again. And since we had been talking about it, and something very Jewish in the book of Revelation caught my attention, which I'll be sharing with you in a few minutes, I wanted to go again briefly on that survey, real simple, of how we know that's not true, that God did not reject the Jewish people. First of all, Jeremiah chapter 31 says that God loves Israel with an everlasting love. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. You would think that'd be enough, right there. But people don't seem to, to read that. So you read a little further in the chapter, and it talks about the new covenant that God made with Israel, the New Testament, which we'll be talking about again in just a couple of moments. And then it says, if the sun stops shining and the waves stop crashing against the shore and you can no longer see stars in the universe, then God will be done with the Jewish people. You would think that would be enough. And all those three things are in one chapter, Jeremiah 31. So this doctrine is false. Number one, God loves Israel with an everlasting love. Number two, he promised Israel that they would be his people forever. Number three, the early church was almost exclusively all Jewish. So how can you say the Jewish people rejected Jesus so God rejected the Jewish people when the whole, Jewish, the whole church was Jewish? To start with, of course, until the message got to non-Jews and non-Jews started flooding in. By the way, it's an inaccurate statement and it's prejudicial to say the Jewish people rejected Jesus. Didn't the Gentile people reject Jesus? Wasn't he killed by Romans? Isn't the Romans that threw the Christians to the lions? So when you say the Jews rejected Christ, that's just anti-Semitism. That's just prejudice. That's like saying black people are evil. Or let me turn it around. There are evil black people. If I just went around and said there are evil black people, that would make me a racist. I would be demonstrating my racism. Yes, there are evil black people, but there's also evil white people and evil Hispanics and so if I single out one race and say they have evil people amongst them, that makes me a racist. Well, to say the Jews rejected Christ is also racism because Gentiles rejected Christ as well, and a lot of Jews didn't reject Christ. Just mention somebody from the Bible. Chances are they're Jewish. So number one, God loves Israel with an everlasting love. Number two, he promised Israel that they would be his people forever. Number three, the early church was almost all Jewish. Number four, the Bible plainly says that this doctrine is false. It talks about it, actually, in Romans chapter 11. Here's what it says. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite. This is the Apostle Paul writing. I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. So it's not like it's one of those doctrines that you could say, oh yeah, I understand why people would believe that. I mean, the Bible plainly says it's not so. So why do people hold to it? Because of anti-Semitism. Number five, of the 27 books in the New Testament, many scholars believe 27 of them were written by Jews. Most scholars and pastors believe 25 of them were written by Jews. 25 out of 27, or 27 out of 27, were written by Jews. Does that make the Jews better people than other people? Of course not. That's not my point. The point I'm trying to make is that God didn't reject the Jewish people. They wrote the New Testament, for goodness sakes. Number six. After Revelation chapter 3, now we're getting closer to where I wanted to go. After Revelation chapter 3, Israel becomes the focus of the book. In fact, the word church doesn't exist in the Bible after Revelation chapter 3. Israel's mentioned a lot, but not the church. And then my seventh evidence that God is not done with the Jewish people is, and this is what's going to lead us into our hermeneutics lesson, is the continuity of the biblical text from a Jewish frame of reference from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And this is what got me thinking on that track. While I was reading the book of Revelation, and I was in the last two chapters, I thought, whoa, that is so cool. 
And it made me think, well, that demonstrates that the New Testament, the book of Revelation, has the exact same cultural frame of reference for its literature that the Old Testament has. It's a Jewish frame of reference. If God was done with the Jewish people, the last thing he'd do is make the book of Revelation a Jewish-centric book with, written in a Jewish style, which it is. Now, there are a couple of words I want to introduce you to for your hermeneutics lesson. Lesson. First word is chiasm, C-H-I-A-S-M, chiasm. The second word is inclusio, or inclusion, inclusio. Here's your definition of the word chiasm. A chiasm is a repeated pattern of concepts and or sentences within a biblical narrative. This thing, chiasm, is a Jewish way of writing literature. I'm going to give you examples of chiasm from the Old Testament and then examples from the New Testament. And then I'll define inclusio, give you examples from the Old Testament and give you examples of the New Testament, making the point that the whole book from Genesis to Revelation is written in a Jewish way, demonstrating the point, again, that God is not done with the Jewish people and giving you a cool hermeneutics lesson, too. So we're going to start in Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to just read it to you, and then I'll point out the chiasm after I've read it. Remember, the definition, a repeated pattern of concepts and or sentences within a biblical narrative. Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, for that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I don't know if you noticed it, but when I show you a diagram of these paragraphs, you'll see it. Let me finish reading the text. One, one more verse. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Okay, here's an outline of that section from BibleDiscernments.com. Check it out. You'll see A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. It says in verse 5, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then it says in verse 9, For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Same concept. Then in verse 6, for our B line, Be strong and be courageous. Be strong and very courageous. And our B line here from verse 9, Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Our C line, Be careful to obey all the law that you may be successful. And our other C line, Be careful to do everything written in it. You may be prosperous and successful. And then our D line, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth and meditate on it day and night. It's a Jewish way of doing literature. Pretty cool when you see it broken down like that, isn't it? Old Testament, this is repeated time and time and time again. But we also see it in the New Testament. So this ancient Jewish literary device is used throughout the Bible in both the Old and New Testament. It's another evidence of the Jewish nature of the text and God's continued relationship with the Jewish people. So guess where I saw it, which got me on this whole rabbit trail? In the book of Revelation. But it blew my mind. Because it's not that I found it in the book of Revelation. It was the book of Revelation. I didn't discover this on my own. As I was doing research, I got this from Creation Concepts. But check it out. I know it's too small for you to see, uh, there may be some handouts in the lobby, but I'll tell you what you're looking here. You're looking at chapter 1 all the way through chapter 22 as a giant chiasm for the entire book of Revelation. 
This would be your A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. A, B, C, D, all the way. It's the exact same thing as the one I showed you in Joshua. To give you a sample of it, it says for the A, the prologue. And here for the A, the epilogue. In other words, the introduction, the opening of the book, the closing of the book. Chapter 2, the seven seals. Chapter 17, the seven angels. Chapter 4, I mean the seven epistles, and then chapter 4 is the seven seals. So in chapter 1, the prologue. Chapter 2, the seven epistles. Chapter 4, the seven seals. Here we have the seven angels, the seven bowls, and the 144,000 tied up to this 144,000. Here in chapter 13, we've got the two beasts. Here in chapter 11, we have the two witnesses. Chapter 12, we have the woman clothed with the sun. Chapter 12, we have the woman's seed keeps the commandments of God. All the way to the woman clothed with the sun, the dragon in heaven, the woman flees to the wilderness, Satan cast out. The whole book of Revelation is a giant chiasm. So now you know what chiasm is. As you start reading through scripture, you can start looking for them on your own. It's pretty exciting. The next thing is called inclusio or inclusion. Uh, some people just call it bracketing. I call it a scriptural sandwich. Here's the definition, and you'll see why. A repetition or parallel of thought and or concepts found at the beginning of a section of scripture and then repeated at the end of that section. So it's kind of like you're reading through the scripture and it says something, and then chapters later it says something just like that again. Ah, bookends. It includes everything in the middle, and it's showing us this is the beginning of this section, this is the end of this section. Let me give you an example from the Old Testament, example from the New Testament. Jeremiah chapter 1. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. This is God talking to the prophet Jeremiah when he brings him into the ministry. He says, I've set you over nations and kingdoms to root out and to pull down to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. I'm not sure what all that means. I know how Jeremiah built and plant, but how did he pull down and destroy and throw down? I'm not sure. Maybe because at the beginning of his ministry, he was preaching judgment against Israel, and later on, he was preaching blessing. I'm not sure. But the point I want to make is the inclusio. This is chapter 1. Now we jump all the way to chapter 24. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant and not pluck them up. Exact same concept. Gives you an idea of the two bookends, starting in chapter uh, 1, ending in chapter 24. Now, let me show you an example of this in the book of Revelation. Like with Joshua, I'll read you the text, and then I'll point it out to you. But now you know what to look for. So as I read the text, see if you can catch some of it. It's, this, is, this is harder than the other stuff I've shown you, but I still think some of you might get it. On Saturday, I asked for a show of hands, and one person raised their hand. One person got it. Let's see. It's hard, but let's see if you can get it. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 4. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Remember when I showed you chiasm? I told you the book of Revelation, I wasn't pointing out chiasm within it. I was pointing out chiasm as the book. Well, for inclusio, this is the last chapter of the Bible. It's the last chapter of Revelation, and it's the last bookend. But where's the first bookend? In Genesis. It starts in Genesis, showing us this is one complete unit. Check it out. We've got Revelation and Genesis. It says in chapter 22, verse 1, a river proceeding from the throne. Why is this in Genesis? Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden. So, I've always wondered why that was in there. It didn't seem to fit. 
Now it fits. I didn't understand it because I only had one bookend. Now with the other bookend, I get it. God is showing us that it's one big story. Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, the tree of life was mentioned. This should have been your clue. In Genesis, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. So at the beginning of the Bible, we open up with the tree of life. At the end of the Bible, we close with the trees of life. Revelation 22, it said there will be no more curse. Where did the curse come in? Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning of the story. Then to Adam he said, cursed is the ground for your sake. Inclusio, the story is continuing and ending in Revelation that started in Genesis. It doesn't end in Malachi, and it doesn't start in Matthew. It starts in Genesis, and it ends in Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4, they shall see his face. Now, we talked quite a bit about this in a previous lesson. But the inclusio for this one, you have to know a little bit about Hebrew to find it. And it's way cool. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The reason I underlined the word presence there... It's because that's not what the Hebrew says. It's his face. It says they hid from God's face. That's what the Hebrew is. So in Genesis chapter 3, we find people hiding from the face of God. And from that point forward through the rest of the Bible, no one can see God and live. But then we get to Revelation and we see him face to face. And this closes up the story. Inclusio. So the idea of inclusio... Everything that was ruined, in this inclusio, everything that was ruined in the garden will be fixed. The curse will be removed. We've never seen that. Only Adam and Eve know what the planet is like without a curse. But in Revelation chapter 22, we are assured it will be removed. And the tree of life that God sent a cherub to guard will now be available. Beginning of the story, it was blocked. The end of the story... It's open for everybody. Well, I told you that the curse will be removed. The curse impacted no less than three major things. Let me share those three with you, and then I'll be done. The curse impacted creation. The curse impacted the human condition. And it impacted God or at least our relationship with God, so indirectly God, which is kind of almost, it feels blasphemous to say that the curse impacted God. How can anything humans do impact God? Well, hey, God made us, and he gave us amazing dignity and amazing power as human beings and amazing authority, and we can impact all of the known universe, and we have. Here's where it starts out in Genesis chapter 3. Then to Adam he said, Because you've eaten from the tree which I have commanded you, saying you shall not even eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. So because of Adam's sin, God cursed the ground. Or we could say because of Adam, the ground was cursed to this very day. How many of you have ever pulled a weed? Where'd that come from? Thorns and thistles, hello, we live in the desert. We know thorns. You can't even walk through our desert without getting spiked. We got nasty thorns. You, can you imagine when the curse is removed? What's a saguaro gonna look like? If there even are saguaro. I imagine all those little needles will be flowers. Poof. Look like candy land, it'll be so cool. That's my idea of what it would look like. I don't know. I just know the ground was cursed, and we're pulling weeds to this very day. I mean, can you imagine going into your backyard after the monsoon and saying, dang, look at all the corn there. <laughs> Corn's hard to grow. Weeds, they just grow. All the good stuff, we can't grow. It. It's hard. You've got to work at it. The junk, it just grows. It's amazing. It ties into the biblical story. The curse impacted creation. But Paul says it's more than just farming. 
It's more than just the ground. It's more than just the earth. The entire universe fell when Adam and Eve fell. You know, if it was made into a movie, you know, you ever seen those movies where it just shows a shockwave and it goes out through space and takes out the Enterprise or something? Imagine a shockwave starting at the Garden of Eden and going out through the entire universe and damaging it. Listen to Romans chapter 8. You'll see where I got this from. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Oh, that's some good news. We can just stop the sermon right there. You know, suffering stinks. I know it does. But Paul assures us it's not even going to be a scratch on the radar compared to the wonderfulness that's coming in the kingdom. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Adam and Eve fell. The relationship with God broken. The entire universe, which we were made stewards of, fell. Earthquakes, hurricanes, disease, weeds. Every bad thing you can think of started right there in Genesis chapter 3. But God says, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to make it so good that you won't even remember how bad it was. Elsewhere it says, you know, kind of like a woman who goes through child labor and birth, pain. But then the baby's born and she forgets about it. How do I know she forgets about it? Because she has more children. My wife did it four times. It's going to be a good day, a glorious day. So the curse impacted three things. It impacted creation. It also impacted, impacted the human condition. Again, Genesis chapter 3. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. That's where it came from. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Uh, most women today say, there's your curse. <laughs> <laughs> then to Adam he said, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Life is rough. You know, the minute you're born, you start to die. And eventually you just become dust, dirt. We all know it. That's why we're put in the ground. We're replanted. But we're planted. For those of us who believe in Jesus, we're like a seed. And we're going to sprout into something amazing. So mankind was impacted physically. Mankind was also impacted spiritually. Sin entered them, and they died spiritually. All of us are born in the same sin-sick condition, Romans chapter 5. Sin came into the world through one man, and his sin brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. And thirdly, it impacted our relationship with God. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. Hid from God's face. You realize mankind has been hiding from God ever since. It's easy for us to, to blame the atheists, or at least to pick on them, because we know they're hiding from God. It's funny, atheists, they hate a God they say doesn't exist. How can you be passionate and hate something that doesn't exist? You tell them you hate a God. No, I don't hate God. He doesn't exist. Well, then why are you making such a big fuss about him? I mean, the Easter Bunny doesn't exist. You don't see me making a fuss about him. 
I don't write books saying Santa Claus isn't real. You know, it's silly. Who, who gets all upset about that? Nobody. But they get all upset about God. They're mad at the God they say doesn't exist. But they're not the only ones hiding from God. I think everybody's hiding from God. In fact, most people don't even know they're hiding from God. The curse makes us spiritually dull and spiritually blind. We are so sick, we don't know we're sick. We're so spiritually blind, we don't know we're spiritually blind. We don't go looking for God because we don't even think to look for God. It's not even on our radar. We need help. That's why he's called the Savior. Because without him, we are toast. In the first book of the Bible, we hide from God's face. In the last chapter of the Bible, Inclusio, we see him face to face. But not everyone will be worthy to look upon the face of God. Those who choose to follow Jesus will be made worthy. And so I'm going to close with that. Those who believe in Jesus will be made worthy. Have you been made worthy? worthy. Two words just to make it simple. Repent and believe. Repent means we acknowledge the sinfulness of our nature and choose to reject it. Believe means we entrust our soul to Jesus to take us to heaven and to fix us. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? I mean, do you really think that's an actual fact? Did it happen? And if you think, yeah, did you make a 100% commitment to follow Jesus? 100% to be his, like a slave is his master's. No longer a personal will, no longer a personal ambition, no personal pride. You are your master's servant forever. Let me tell you something. In ancient Israel, when you were poor and starving, you could sell yourself to a wealthy landowner and he would take care of you. And you would do it for seven years. And then you could go free. But in those seven years, he took care of you and fed you and took care of your family and treated you well. If he didn't, you just left. But if you thought, you know what, I'm better with this guy than I've been with anybody, I think I want to stay for the rest of my life. Then my family will be taken care of. This guy knows how to handle farms. I obviously don't. He's rich, I was poor. So you go to him, you get some witnesses and say, you know, I want to serve you forever, for the rest of my life. That's kind of what it's like. Have you gotten to a place in your life where you realize without Jesus, you're toast? Life is hard, it's not, there's no hope. There's nothing for you. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But with Jesus, you have the universe. You have God's face. You have paradise that's going to be so wonderful that you won't even remember this former pain. If you've not yet made a decision to follow Jesus, ask yourself one question. Why? And answer it. And then ask yourself if that's a good answer. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for showing us that your hand was on the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's a divine book in so many levels. Thank you for letting us see it. But as fun as, and as encouraging as that is, thank you for letting us see Jesus face to face, for knowing who he is. And I pray for my friends who are here this morning, those who might be watching online, and those who might be watching this video down the road uh, who maybe don't yet believe in Jesus or maybe believe but haven't committed pray you would touch their hearts, Lord. And if there's anything we can do here at Book of Life to help more people believe in you, please show us and help us do it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to stand as we worship the Lord, please feel free to do so. me. Mm -hmm.
grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved? How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed? My chains are gone, I've been set free. God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Lord, as promised, good to me, His word, my hope, secure. life endures. My chains are gone. I've been set free. God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone. Ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are celebrate and it's going to be so awesome when we're there together and we don't have to struggle anymore ready we're going to sing a song of celebration sing a song of celebration lift up a shout of praise for the bridegroom will come Glorious one, oh, we will look on his face. Go to a much better place. Dance with all your might. Dance with all your might. Lift up your hands and clap for joy for the time showing me. this bride we will dance on the streets at our golden the glorious bride and the great son of man from every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the land sing a song sing a song of celebration lift up a shout 
shout of praise for the bridegroom will come glorious one Look on his face. Go to a much better place. Dance with all your might. Lift up your hands and clap for joy. For the time's drawing near. He will appear. Strong, he'll spot this bride. We will dance on the streets at our golden, the glorious bride and the great son of man. From every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the land. Dance on the streets at our golden, the glorious bride and the great son of man. From every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the man. Will join in the song of the man. We will dance on the streets at our golden. The glorious bride and the great son of man From every tongue and tribe and nation Will join in the song of the land We will dance on the streets that are golden The glorious bride and the great son of man From every tongue and tribe and nation Will join song of the land join in the song of the land join in the song of the land Well, maybe uh, some of your friends aren't here this morning. Uh, maybe they're not feeling well. Give them a call. See how they're doing. Bless them. And uh, be blessed this week. I'll see you on Sunday. But uh, before you go, go up to Nick and ask him a really hard question. <laughs> You're dismissed. <laughs>